Is it uh, loud? <laughs> it's okay if we start a little differently. Um, rather than me jumping into spiritual calisthenics and my voice wavering up and down, and can I just sit and talk with you for a second? And, and, and this is kind of like, you're going to be the counselor and I'm, I'm the one in the therapy chair here. Is that okay? And it's not going to do the whole sermon, just for a minute. Yesterday felt really good. Here's what I mean by that. Yesterday felt really good, and I'm referring to the fact it being 9-11. And to say it felt good, I, I feel bad saying. But there was something about seeing tears shed, seeing a tattered flag, and remembering what it was like 20 years ago when we all kind of came together. It was awful. I mean, the, the entirety of it was awful. But there was this part of me that was like, man, it felt so good. It felt so good to look at anyone in our country and knew they were with me. It felt so good to feel like family. And, and I guess what I'm getting to is I, I do not celebrate what happened on 9-11. But I celebrate how we reacted as a family. I think it's the same reason I like the Olympics. And here's what I mean. We spend the entirety of, of our lives kind of picking an enemy. And for too long, it has been politics and pandemic and who looks at it differently than you. And it felt so good to cry together as a nation and throughout arenas across our country, hearing people chant USA, USA, USA. It felt good. And I'm telling you guys, as the church, God gives us that opportunity every single Sunday. It, it, that we get to come together in sorrow and celebration. That we get to be people drawn together. And so on this 20th anniversary, it just felt good to see what we've done. Who we've been. And, and I just want to take a moment, I just want to thank God for all that he's done through that. And then we'll, we'll dive in. Father, for such a tragic moment, it pains me to know and to think through and process that you are a God that is in control. It pains me to see things fall and yet realize I must stand for you. So, Father, in some way, I appreciate your way, how you draw people together, how you bring people together. And God, may we realize that terror is real. May we be drawn to you first, drawn to those around us in love second. And all of this I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being my therapist through this. Um, the confidentiality agreement uh, you signed on your way in, please uphold. No, um, here's, here's the thing about America. Americans, we're all Americans. I hope you're all Americans. I don't know if you're all Americans. I'm not trying to offend you if you're not American. If one of you from France, there's, there's one there. Um, if you came in from another country today, welcome. We are egocentric. Like, we are very American-minded. And, and, and one of the funny ways I've seen this is I remember a group, uh, a group of students, we were all hanging out together, and uh, they were laughing at this gal because, like, what do you mean you've never celebrated the 4th of July? She was our exchange student from Panama. Like, what do you mean? You, do you celebrate Christmas? And I was like, what? This is ridiculous. Like, they didn't get it. We're so American-focused. And, and so just to see how that happens. Um, but there is some things. There are some things that will look beyond ourselves into other countries, Okay. So the things that draw us in are those chants of USA, USA. And, I, and you know why I like the Olympics? It's because all of us are like, boo Russia, boo China, go America. And that's why I didn't live during it, but I've, hold, I've heard the time of Cold War. Like Americans were tight-knit because there was an obvious enemy we're going to be pulling in together. Even though there wasn't a war going on, there was an obvious enemy. As we look at America, as we look at what this, and one, one way we looked outside of America in my lifetime 
where we kind of got hyped up about some other country's business, that's the royal family. Okay, you know what I'm talking about? Like when, when princes make princesses and they get married and they have the, and, and you see this big banquets, you see all this going on. And so I, I wanted to visualize that for a second to imagine if there was some sort of American royal family and that we're all involved, okay? That somehow in some way one of us here is, is marrying into the royal family and all of us are honored guests, all of us get to show up, all of us get to go, okay? Now, I mean, that's, that's pretty exciting. Now, mind you, this is an event where, where clothing designers go out of their way to, to put, the, put you in their garb so it'll be seen as you're walking in. Where auto manufacturers say, hey, will you take our car and drive it there? Because they want it to be seen. That there's so much on display, that it's such a grand event, that there's all that's put into it. At Southgate, we're invited because one amongst us is getting married in into the family. That's awesome. That's exciting. Okay, now, so we're at this event. It is the event of all events that we've talked about our coworkers. Sorry, I'll be out for the week. I'm going to be at the banquet. The what banquet? You know, the royal family. Like, there's a sense of pride. Like, we are psyched about this, okay? We do the whole wave, and like, I'm a big deal. We walk into the wedding hall. We're there for the wedding. It is awesome. I mean, it's a big deal. And we get shuffled into the grandest of American banquet halls where the, where the setup is so pristine. You've been at one of those restaurants, you, really, you look at your kids, you're like, don't touch anything. Like that sort of stuff. Like where, when you pick up the knife, you're like, I've never, I've never felt this type of metal before. Like it's just awesome. Okay? And you get in there and you, oh, you're hungry. Because this has been a build up all day. There's been this dramatic turn of events. And you are here to celebrate. And, and the prince and princess step in and they say, we're so excited you're our guests. We are so excited you're here. And you know what? Because we love people and we care about people, we've decided that for this banquet, we're not going to eat, and, and we've taken all the food, and we've sent it to the local homeless shelter, and we're just going to kind of sit, and for the next few hours, we're just going to fast and think of others. Who's about to pocket a couple of those forks right now? I mean, you're like, I, I love the sentiment, now's not a good time. I mean, do you see what I'm saying? You're like, oh, that's sweet, but give me something to eat, you know? That, I mean, that's where we would be at. Okay, and, and there would be this little irk, this, this oh, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of this. This is what would be going on. Because when you're at the wedding banquet, it's time to feast. It's a celebration. It's a time to bring out the best of the best. It's one of those times where you're like, I can't even pronounce what I'm about to put in my mouth. It's that awesome. One of those times. And then to be told, you know what, we're going to give it to someone else. What's going on in Mark chapter 2, with, with, if you're with us, I know some of you may not have known, we started reading Mark as a church family, okay? Last week we went through Mark 1, this week we're getting into Mark 2. I'm going to preach the parables on the Sundays, and we've hit our first parable. But to lead into this, the Pharisees ask a question. The Pharisees bring this up. John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. This is from Mark 2, verse 18. Some people came, they asked Jesus, how is it? That John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not. Okay, so a question of fasting is brought forward. This is where I'm going to get into spiritual calisthenics. I don't need this chair anymore. But well, this is a question asked, and Jesus is going to answer this question. Mind you, give yourself that visual of, I want to eat. Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he was with them? They cannot so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. So, right now, you ask yourself, is this a question on fasting? The Old Testament, here is the Old Testament requirements on fasting. Are you ready for this? It was one time a year. It was the Day of Atonement. This is the question on fasting that the Pharisees, to heighten themselves, to allow people to see how spiritually strong they were, they took that one time a year and they upped it and said, you know what, we're going to fast weekly. And another group of Pharisees is like, yeah, well, we're going to fast two times a week. And all of a sudden, there is this, this level that has been raised that's not biblical, but is traditional for those of the Pharisee sect to fast twice a week. Now, John's disciples, they were holy. They were pursuing God. They were doing the same thing. And that's where we got to understand this question on fasting is not about fasting. It's a question on legalism. 
And John Piper has this quote. He says, the essence of legalism is when faith is not the engine of obedience. Now, mind you, I think John's disciples, there was faith there. There was a hunger. There was a hunger for righteousness. And they were fasting in that vein. But the Pharisees were fasting out of making themselves look good and were drawing John's disciples into that and pulling John's disciples into that. And this becomes the question. Here is what legalism is. When you take a God-given thing and make it a good thing, and you earning God's favor. Here's what I mean. We're reading Mark. That's a good thing, right? How many of you would say reading the Bible is a good thing? Okay, awesome. We're, we're in agreement there. We're pretty much across the board. Some of us didn't feel like raising our arms, but that's because we're so tired, and that's okay. But here's the thing. If I took that good thing of reading the Bible and said, hey, guess what? Every single day, you're reading Mark at this time. And if you don't, we're going to give you grief. All of a sudden, I've put weight of burden behind a good blessing. Is that making sense? Now here, as a church, there is times to go into specific things for a specific way, but it is not to be burdensome. Prayer is good. Fasting is good. Scripture is good. And it can become a burden if you enter into it out of obligation rather than faith. We got that? Here's the thing. I don't want you to avoid legalism by thinking, well, I shouldn't read my Bible. I shouldn't be in prayer. No, no, no. Do those things, but do them out of a heart that we're going to talk about here coming up. Don't force those things. Don't make yourself go through. As we look at the entirety of Mark, we talked about last week, it's an identity mystery. You'd be like, I know who Jesus is. But for those that are going through the story, there is not a certainty on who Jesus is. But Jesus is going to give hints. Jesus is going to give clues. The only people that know who Jesus is is the writer. He's writing the book. We hope he knows. Us as the readers, because we know the full story. And the demons, which Jesus tells to shush, don't talk about. But as we go through, Jesus is giving hints and little bits of who he is. If he was to come out from the get-go saying, I am the son of God, all of a sudden things are going to get stalled really quickly by the Pharisees. So he's going to drop these hints. And here's the first hint in this parable. Jesus is labeling himself as the bridegroom indirectly. Okay? Right here, Jesus is saying who he is. And I'm going to hit some Old Testament references. As a young man marries a young woman, so will your builder, capital B, that is the divine, marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. Pause for one second. Those of you that have been married, those of you that have an idea of what marriage is going to be like, I don't know how you frame an understanding of God, but I want you to frame however you can the face of God being at one end of the aisle that you're walking down, and he is so excited. He is so excited. Oh. And not is he reeling you in, he's rejoicing over that. There's tears flowing. There is a passionate understanding. Because I will tell you this, there are many ways to view God. I'm going to give you a couple of them today. But if you've never looked at God in this way, he's at the end of the aisle, just tears flowing, just excited, just overcome, watching you and him about to unite. And that is a beautiful thing. And Jesus says he is the bridegroom. I'm going to hit a couple more Old Testament references. Hosea chapter 2, I will make you my wife forever. I've never thought, you know what, I want to be a wife but man, if God's saying it, I'll do it. Give me the dress. I'm putting it on. Showing you righteousness and justice, unfailing love and compassion. I will be faithful to you and make you mine. And you will finally know me as Lord. You see what it says there? It doesn't say you're going to know me as Lord and then we'll get married. It's going to say as that's happening, as we are drawn together, as our lives are knit together, as we, in commitment, become meshed together as one, that's when you're going to know me, says the Lord. I think I got one more from the Old Testament. No, I don't, from the New Testament. John chapter 3, I only have one of the verses up there, but in John 3, going and talk, talking to Jesus, uh, John the Baptist, words, the, the disciples are wanting to know what's going on, what's happening here, and I want to read it for you uh, real quick. John's disciples approach him. Rabbi, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan River, the one you identified as the Messiah, he's also baptizing people. And everybody is going to him instead of coming to us. Oh, uh-oh. 
John replies, no one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven. You yourselves know how plainly I told you, I am not the Messiah. I am only here to prepare the way for him. The verse that's up on the screen. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride, and the best man is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. He must become greater and greater. I must become less and less. What is the Christian life to be? What is discipleship? What, what, what are we to be about? We are to be those that have wed the Lord, and then we are those that are participating in the wedding of others. That's discipleship. To watch someone walk down the aisle to the eyes of the Lord. Have you been at a wedding where you're just like, yes! Like you're so excited for, for what's going on. Like you just want to celebrate. You just want to, or maybe you're, you've been, the, you're maybe the, who's here a wedding crier? I know you're out there. Like when everyone stands and the tears just start flowing, you're like, I can't stop. That's our lives as participants in the gospel that we put our passion to the one we're wed to and then we turn our passion to those that can come and be wed to the Lord. And when we watch people walk into baptism, as we watch people into confessing a faith and commitment to Christ, the tears flow and we're happy and we're crying and some of us are making like awful, ugly, sad crying faces, but we're just so excited and that's to be the Christian life that we're continually in that place of celebration. And this is what John is saying. I'm going to become less. He's going to become greater. Who is Jesus? He is the bridegroom. Who is Jesus? He is the one that sweeps us off our feet. Who is Jesus? He's the one that pulls us out of the pit of despair. And he says, hey, I'm the prince. You're now the princess. And guess what? I'll put on the dress. I'll be called princess if it means being aligned with Jesus Christ. Some of you are like, I've heard him say worse, putting on a dress, being called princess, it's nothing. It's nothing. All right. Jesus is the bridegroom. This is where we get to the parable. I've set all this up to get to our parable on the cloth and the wineskin. All right. We are to be the people wed to an almighty Lord. Jesus is going to talk about cloth. Jesus is going to talk about wineskins. Let's dig in. Parables number one in Mark chapter two. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. Do we get the logistics here? You got your favorite jacket, you got your favorite jeans, you blow a hole in it. If you take an unwashed garment and sew it up, sounds great, looks great, but when that new patch shrinks, it's just gonna tear the thing up. You've ruined two, the old one and the new you chopped up. We got that? Moving on, that's pretty simple. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. There may be confusion there. I'll explain in a second. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. All right, here's the gist. We get wine in bottles. At that time, wine came in carcasses. Drink up, okay? That was their bottle. It was, it was goat skin. All right, some of you are like, the bottle doesn't sound so bad anymore. Okay, that was their bottle. Now, here's the thing. You would take a new goat skin, you would fill it with the wine that needed to ferment, and the skin would have to accept that fermentation, a release of carbon dioxide, I believe. By the way, any of you that ever made yeast or bread ever broken something or popped something from that expansion? Okay, separate story. But that, that leather would have to have room to expand and grow. Here's the thing. If you had leather seats... You know how they get worn, and eventually they, they get to that certain place, but then if you wear them too much, they break. Same thing with a leather jacket. It fits all the holes. It fits well, but then all of a sudden it may tear. Wineskins could be used once. Wineskins could be pliable up for one time, and then they would become hardened because they had stretched to the limit, and the leather would become hard. That's what I'm talking about, those leather seats or leather coat, those sections that become hard. They're no longer pliable. They're no longer movable, and this is what he is talking about. He is saying, you cannot use that old structure again. This is what he's trying to get across. That a patchway on an old system, when we're talking about the cloth, is not possible. Do you get that? Patchwork on an old system is not possible. New content in old structures is not possible. Now, I want us to hear something. We are going to go through life where we are going to find ourselves with busted patches and broken wineskins. All right? This is going to happen. There's going to be a flow in our lives. Hear what I mean. Is that we're going to struggle 
with legalism on our own. And I want to clarify this. Legalism isn't the right side or the traditional side. Legalism is all around. It is apparent in so many ways and so many different areas. You can't point in one direction to where legalism is. It's all around us. It's a heart condition. It's not a certain place people are. It is all around. Okay? We're going to look at legalism and how it hits. Here is the thing. We cannot take the structure of the old law and Jesus give it just a little boost to make it better. Jesus is all new. Jesus says, I have come to fulfill the law. When something is fulfilled, it has been used. It has been done. It served its purpose. Is Jesus saying the law was bad? No, it has served its purpose and it's no longer needed. The gospel of Jesus, the gospel of the kingdom of God, what he is pouring out, this new wine, it tastes like grace. This, that he knew wine he is pouring out, it is a life in Jesus, not a built upon our works, but built behind his works on the cross. This is what he is pouring out. And this new wine, it is a new joy for those that receive it and must understand this. If you want to receive it while holding on to the system of law and the works, you are going to stretch and you are going to burst. Okay? If you want to receive grace and at the same time hold on to your works, that is going to rip two things apart. This is what's being said. It's going to stretch those old systems. It's going to stretch those old ways. It's going to break them. It is going to build pressure that's going to pop it. All right? Here we go. I want us to look for a second at how legalism occurs. All right? Here's the thing. All of these things I'm about to talk about, you may hit you may get away from, you may come back to. We have to be aware. Also, what I'm about to say, don't look around the room and go, that guy. This is for you, all right? And if it's not for you today, it's going to be for you at some point tomorrow, okay? Understood? These have hit me as well. I'm not like, hey, let me pick all the problems everyone has but me. These are also my problems that either I have had and I know I'm going to have. But here we go. These are legalism heart hints. These are things that if we see or we hear, hold up, maybe I have got a heart that's a little bit hardened. Here's the first one. When you can articulate, God loves me, but I don't know if he likes me. If you cannot grasp that God delights in you, you failed to grasp the love of God. That, that visual of God being the one up front and you walking forward to him, I mean, he's excited. And guess what? He knows all the flaws. He knows them. It's not, we don't on the wedding day walk with our hands behind our back and like, hope they don't find out. God knows. And we've got to understand in our view of God, is there a place of delight? Is there a smile? Is there a rejoicing over us? Not based on what we did, but on the fact that we accept what Christ has done for us. Or is there that sad face? Is there that grumpy face? Is it the ruler with the, the teacher with the ruler smacking the table expecting more? Did you guys ever have that teacher? No? Just me? Okay. The heart hints at legalism. If you understand and you get God loves me, but man, I just don't think he likes me. That's hint number one. But I want to go on. Because I think a lot of us here get stuck. And, and I want to, and I'm not going to go all the way into it. But if this is you, this is bonus hour. If you feel as though I, God loves me, but I don't think he likes me, Colossians 3 was written for you. And here's, here's the thing. We, we get in scripture the phrase, your sins and lawless acts, I will remember no more. That we are told in our acceptance of walking and being committed and loving. He says, I'm not remembering the sins anymore. And then we sin and go, but I remember them, so you have to. It's not how it works. Okay? It's not how it works. In Colossians 3, I just want to hit a couple things. In verse 3, our lives are now hidden in Christ. That sounds awesome. I know my life. I know Christ's life. I'd rather be there. Our lives are hidden in Christ. Christ, I know how ridiculous I am. Do you know, the, you know the Muppet Man where like the Muppets climb on each other and walk in as a man? You know what I'm talking about? That's me in Christ, okay? People are like, he's there, but we'll accept him. 
you know, that, that, that I've got to understand I am in Christ, even no matter I realize how ridiculous and how bad my struggles and my sins are. But here's the thing. Okay, so my life's in Christ. And then verse 5, he goes on, but so get rid of or put away. Are you catching that? He says, your life is hidden in Christ. Get rid of the junk. And in verse 5, he goes through those different things. And then he says in verse 10, put on. So here's, here's where we're at. This is, I'm trying to get you the framework. You are in Christ. Get rid of the stuff that's not Christ-like. Put on the things that are Christ-like. Where was the you are in Christ come at? Was that the end or the beginning? It's at the beginning. And so bit by bit, as I'm hidden in Christ, I try to look more and more like Christ. And then in verse 14, verse 14, he says, clothe yourselves. This is important because I want to show you a recent clothing snafu. The Hoosiers took the field for their first game this season wearing these jerseys. I don't even know how to pronounce that. Indonina. The Indonina Hoosiers. Clearly, that is misspelled. Guess what? They played the game. They were not denied the fact that they were on the team. I want you to get something. Just because you've recognized your mistakes doesn't discount the fact that you are clothed and you are a part of the team, okay? Just because you walk forward in your Christianity and it feels like, man, some things are out of place, some things are not right, hey, you still get to take the field. You still are a member of faith. This is who you are, dress like it. This is who you are, dress like it. And when you realize there's some things messed up and you realize there's some problems, hey, next time, fix that thing. Get rid of, put on. Take the field, keep going, even in the midst of your mistakes. Second hint, you have an uncertainty with your salvation. And you ask yourself this question, as I have asked myself this question, have I done enough? I've looked into this question. I've searched high and low. I, I, I've gone to people wiser than me. I've, I've searched the scriptures. I can give each of you individually and collectively the answer to this question. Have I done enough? Have you done enough? No. No. Not at all. Not even close. And if you are uncertain in your salvation, that means you are putting the weight of your saving grace on your works and not on the work of Christ. Understand that? How do we look at the things we do? It's obvious through scripture. We're supposed to do certain things. How do we do these things without feeling as if we're earning or paying back or trying to get the, the grace that is freely given? How can I live a life for the Lord without drifting or following or frankly just running with the flag of legalism? How can I check myself? I will tell you how. Are you guys ready for this? In everything you do, whether it's the study of scripture, whether it's the opening of the hand of service, whether it's coming to God in prayer, any of these things you do that are bound in scripture that you are told those that love the Lord, those that belong to the Lord do, any of those things you do, you come in it in this way. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. If you cannot act through that motion, there's going to be this burden upon you. Oh, I wish I could get Jesus to love me, doesn't have the same tune. The things we do come out of love, not to earn the love. Why? The last line, because he first loved me. Because he first loved me. And we've got to understand that. We can never do enough. We can never do enough. We're going to come out with our, our name misspelled. We're going to come out with dirty hands. And then we start cleaning, not to earn. We clean because we love Jesus. Number three, comparison Christianity. Legalism pits me against my brothers and sisters. You ever fist pumped and someone else fails? You know, goody two-shoes, mess up. You hear they did something wrong, you're like, ha <laughs> 
what are we thinking? Have you ever been kind of upset and angry when we should have been surrounding and celebrating a victory for a brother or sister in Christ? <laughs> there, there is no pecking order. Okay? There is no, I got I to gotta get to this level. If comparison Christianity is what saves you, you are going to spend your life trying to belittle and push down others so you are ahead of the pack. And that is not how faith works. Legalism pits us against one another. We want to push each other down. Grace, gracious grace, celebrates the wedding. It gets excited. Now, this is what Jesus is talking about. It's a talking about legalism. I want to hit two things, and I'm hitting them quick. I want to talk about the lawlessness that some hearts find. That would be the opposite of legalism. And then I want to talk about how a church, a body of believers itself, becomes legalist. Here we go, real quick. Lawless hearts. These are hints that your hearts give, okay? That maybe you're the opposite of legalism. You're, you're just living lawlessly. You care more about man's approval. And what that means is you are driven by the times, the, the hot topic event, rather than the truth of Scripture. Oh, this is what the world wants to see, so I need to look this way. No. What does God say? His truths are timeless. Number two, the cross does not affect your life. It's a little charm. It's a little thing you rub, like a lucky rabbit's foot. I'm better than you. I'm going to wear it around my neck so you know. That's not the cross. Do you realize what the cross is for? We recognize right at that place, you're an almighty God, and you have paid for my sins. Those sins that are what's separated. You have fulfilled the law in my life. You have fulfilled the wrath I deserve. I come in tears for the sorrow of knowing who I am. And I come with arms outsended in praise for who you say that I now am. And we walk and we pray, oh, how I love Jesus. The other way, the clear way you live a lawless heart is if you will not listen to condemnation. Well, the Bible says, I don't care what the Bible says. God loves me. Eey. Maybe you need to listen to the love. Maybe you need to hear, because here's the thing. When we hear condemnation upon ourselves or others, that sin and that struggle brings us back to the cross, which brings us back to our Savior, which brings us back to that place of grace and giving God all the glory. All right? And lastly, I want to hit on church. This is us as a family. This is why we as a family at Southgate could become legalists, okay? Don't look at other churches. Don't think, mm, they're this way. Mm, this is for us. This is us right here, right now. Legalist church hints. Outsiders have to behave to belong. When the standard is your conformity rather than the grace of Christ. I don't know about them. I don't know. Listen, if I can be your preacher, anyone should be able to be a part of this family. Let's be honest. Here's another one. Worlds and justices, they don't matter. The only thing that matters is are our traditions being upheld? And if they are, let's press them upon other people. We have a Savior that came to love people, that came with a heart broken for how people were treating people. Our heart should break for the same things. Our heart should break for people that we see are being oppressed. Our heart should break for those that are being taken advantage of. Our heart should give just a faint bit of care for the simple legalist traditions we impose upon ourselves. If we turn and look inward, all of us will end up wagging our fingers at each other. If we turn outward, all of us are going to open our hands to the world around us. And the final thing, the final thing of a legalist church is it lacks joy and grace. Because we're too busy gritting our, tree, gritting our teeth trying to get it right and fit the mold. Okay? To try and get those unwritten rules right. I have been, in my own life, ostracized and kicked out of places because I broke rules I didn't know exist. I was like, really? Ouch. I have been shunned. I have been convers Have you ever watched a conversation shift away from you when they realize you didn't agree? I was like, oh, that whole group of people just moved. We need to be a church that is built on people that belong to God through the life, death, 
and resurrection of Jesus Christ who have walked the aisle and are celebrating those that are going to come walk the aisle. And what we don't need to be about is how's the lighting in the room? How are the chairs? Which aisle are we going? How are we going to do these things? All that stuff's got to be set aside and we focus on the love God has given us. We focus on everything he has done. How do you avoid legalism? I want you to hear this. Jesus did not come to improve your life. He came to give you a new life. Jesus did not come to patch your problems. Jesus came to die so you could put to death those problems and live with him. Jesus did not come to fix your life. Jesus died. Jesus rose. That's the fix. You get a new life. You get a new life. Jesus didn't come to correct your life. Jesus came to give you new life. Jesus is not a get better scheme. Jesus is not a a let's fix you up scheme. Jesus says when you come to me, you die. You're risen in a new life. This is the life God has given. This is the life God wants us in. This is the simple gospel message that has to ring true that has to be there over and over again and if we're not willing to simply hear that simple truth I am a sinner separated by what I have done and Jesus has come and he said I want you I'm bringing you to the banquet I'm bringing you to the wedding come be with me commit to me and if we can recognize the simple gospel is I chosen by the love of a savior to come out of that separation, to belong to him and him to die, to pay for my sin and to rise, to give me his righteousness, that I can live in that place and all of a sudden I care a whole lot less about the things I'm doing and I care a whole lot more about what Christ has done for me and Christ is continually doing in me. His mercies, brothers and sisters, his mercies are new every day morning. He is a God that says, give me a new song. He is a God that says, I'm going to give you a new heart. And I know we are fans, a lot of us, of the old things and the old ways, and God is timeless. But we've got to understand that there are people that new wine is going to pour out to. And if we become the rigid wineskin, things are going to burst. We've got to let the gospel fountain flow. We've got to let people come to Christ completely dirty, completely messed up, and completely understand it is the life of Christ that saves. And in that life, we turn around and go, oh, how I love Jesus. And we walk forward because he first loved me.